Stanford University. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here. There's probably a number of people uh, in the room that grew up in Christian homes and were taught about Jesus about the same time they were learning the alphabet and their numbers and their colors. There are some of you here that, for whom that's not true, uh, but I'm, I'm going to uh, speak from that experience anyway because that's the way I came to know uh, the Lord, to know the person of Jesus. And one of the things that one learns about Jesus when catechized inside a, an orderly Christian home is that Jesus is nice. Jesus is our friend. And I remember being in a Catholic school where um, we were awarded for good uh, academic work in, uh, in the classroom work with little cards, holy cards, pictures of the saints and so on. And the ones that would have Jesus when you were a little kid often would have Jesus depicted as a little kid in the carpenter shop, helping Joseph and uh, ap appearing to be obedient and take direction and um, look like the perfect child. There's that one scene when he's 12 years old that we get in Luke's gospel where he's uh, absolutely disobedient and he's caused his parents all this heartbreak. They've been looking high and low for him and then he kind of is a little sassy. You know, well, didn't you think to look in my father's house? That's where I'd be. Well, there's, uh, if, if Jesus is a robust, fully human person, there's probably uh, a kind of full range of emotion and a full range of behaviors that one might expect to see in him. I think that over time and in the 27 years I've been a preacher, um, I've, I think I've preached mostly the love of God for us as manifest in the person of Jesus. And a lot of times we think of love as a force in the world that is uh, unitive because it brings people together. I listened to several love songs on the radio on my drive in tonight um, that it draws people together it overcomes uh, difference. It, um, it, it uh, like if you think Valentine's Day, love makes bubble up a lot of sweet sentiment, so on. But you can probably tell tonight I'm going in a different direction because of the title of the talk. Law and disorder. When we're children, we're taught about orderliness and the importance of it. Some of it's for our own safety. You know don't run into the street. The street isn't a place to play. It, that would be disorder because the cars belong there and you belong in the yard. You know? uh, so sometimes we're taught about order in order just for us to be safe or for us to learn about playing well with others, sharing, uh, putting things away, all the things that we have to be told when we're little that have to do with order and they also have to do with right relationship. You know, being patient uh, and courteous and all those things. But there's also a character of love that maybe, is, maybe it's kind of age appropriate. Maybe we couldn't learn about how love disrupts when we're really little. But I think I'm addressing an adult audience. Tonight we're talking about how love can disrupt. There's one point near the end of Jesus' life where he kind of says with exasperation, do you think I came here to bring peace? I tell you, I've come to bring a sword. And then he goes, you know this, don't you? He, he lists all these family relationships. I've come to pit you know, mother against daughter and so on. It goes on at some length with different family relationships. The effect of my being in the world, you would think it would be unitive because we often think of love that way. However, you're going to find that I also have an effect in the world because of my loving that pits people against one another, at least temporarily, maybe more. But anyway, that's kind of the, the way of where I'm going with this tonight. The, the, the idea is law and disorder, the impact of Jesus' love in the world disrupting things. Okay? Uh, d uh, if you haven't got a, a Bible, I brought over all the ones that I had in my office. If you'll raise your hand, uh, the lovely Lourdes will see that you get one. You might not absolutely need it because I'm going to read from the, the sections. And what I'm trying to do in 45 minutes 
is give you a taste of, uh, of how Mark's gospel, we're at the end of the year of Mark. We've been in Mark all the way since last November and there's only a couple more weeks of the liturgical year. But I want to kind of sum it up with a kind of a sense of how Mark sees Jesus disrupting the world. He's loving it, but he's disrupting it at the same time. So I've made a little handout for you. Uh, there might be enough for everybody. If not, you're, I'm sure you're very near someone. So you know how I love words and etymology? Think of the word disrupt. What do you think it's related to? Disrupt. Yes, rupture. Absolutely. Uh, rip, tear, rend, break, break in, break open, plunder. If you look up disrupt, as I did, or rupture, <laughs> Those are the words that, uh, that are related to this idea of rupture. So it, they all have to do with something sort of violent, but the, so Jesus is going to compare himself with a robber at one point. Um, but he's also going to uh, talk a lot about seeds and growth and how the seed has to burst open. So we're going to look at a lot of different ways that, that the idea of rupturing the order is part of what Jesus does. So if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, I'm going to read to you anyway, so you don't really have to. I heard somebody say they didn't have their glasses or it's not light enough or whatever. I'm going to read to you. At, at the, in the fir very first chapter of Mark's Gospel, uh, we're going to see Jesus baptized. So there's this scene of John the Baptist. He's going to be preaching. Jesus is going to walk into the scene and He's going to, uh, he and John the Baptist are going to have this kind of little back and forth about, uh, oh, but you should be baptizing me or whatever. And Jesus just says, would you do it? Would you just baptize me? And it says, immediately on coming up out of the water, Jesus saw the sky ripped in two and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice comes to him from the heavens and says, you are my beloved son. On you my favor rests. I think that on you my favor rests sounds strange to the English speaking ear. It's, I just prefer to say I'm thrilled with you. I'm wild about you. I'm crazy about you. Fill in your own like colloquial English there. It's, it's, it's the father saying I'm out of my mind in love with you. Crazy thrilled about you. And the important thing is that you, as Jesus is the first fruits, we're the ones who are to follow him. It's important that each of us hears that in whatever words pierce your heart. Can you hear God say to you, you are my child, you're beloved to me, in fact, I'm wild about you. I hope you can. And I not only hope you can hear that for yourself, but I hope you're living lives that help other people around you hear it. I know that you are, because I know a lot of you. That by the way you, you relate to other people, you, are the, you become the message so that they can hear God speak to them and say, oh yes, you do belong to me and I'm wild about you. Well, in Mark's version of that story, the sky isn't just opened, because Mark doesn't use a, a simple verb when a violent one could do. <laughs> he, he always says he's over the top verbs and, and and Jesus here sees the sky split in two because that, for Mark, is the impact that Jesus is going to have coming into the world. You would like to think that he's going to come and start this little pacifist movement and so on, but in fact, the impact of his presence in the world is going to rip it wide open. But some of what he's going to rip open needed to be ripped open, and that's the reason he's here. It's good news that the sky is ripped in two. And then, then there's this dove, the symbol of peace, because he isn't here to, to blow the place away. He really is here to love, and love is also tender. But it's first the sky is going to rip, and then this dove, or, or the spirit is going to descend kind of like a dove, and, you're gonna, and he's going to hear this, this voice, you're my beloved. So it starts with that, that the disruption in Mark starts right out of the gate. On the little handout that I've given you, when you break into your... Uh, um, cohort groups in a little while, I put three little question marks and I put the questions in italics. What would have to be ruptured in you in order for it to hear you, these words spoken to you? Is it just too hard for you to hear that you're loved to the core of your being? And if so, what needs to be ripped up inside you? What do we need to tear open so that you can hear that? And is love ever broken into your life? 
It might have come in a quiet, orderly, nice way. Or love might have come into your life in a way that was shocking and surprising and blew you away. Well, in chapter, at the end of chapter 1, it says, at that point, the Spirit, the translation I have says, sent him out. Well, you can pretty much cross that out because Mark wouldn't use a verb like sent. The Spirit threw him out. The, in the Greek, it's ekbalo, like from ball. The Spirit took Jesus like a ball and threw him in the desert with the wild beasts. And the angels waited on him. He comes to his hometown of Capernaum. Uh, at, I'm at chapter 1, verse 21. He comes into his hometown synagogue and he begins to teach. And at, at first it was okay. The people are spellbound by his teaching because he taught with authority and not like the scribes. He wasn't footnoting all, everything he said. He was just saying stuff and it was true. And people could hear the truth of it. And so, so far, so good. He says, um, the reign of God is at hand. Reform. Believe. Drop what you're doing. The, the, the time is now. Well, he's there and he's speaking this message that's completely uh, absorbing them. And an unclean spirit begins to scream. There's somebody there with an unclean spirit who's screaming, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come here to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Right? Well, it's violent, and there's convulsing. Somebody's being ripped around inside. There's some kind of fight going on inside this person in the synagogue. It says, the, it, the man, unclean spirit convulsed the man violently, and with a loud shriek came out of him. And everybody that was there was amazed. And they started asking each other, what's this mean? A completely new teaching with a spirit of authority. He gives orders to the unclean spirits, and they obey, and his reputation begins to spread, which sounds like a great thing if you want to back a winner. Because more and more people are hearing about him, and it sounds like, wow, uh, you hope you bought stock in Jesus because he's on a steep curve. Well, the next, in the next scene, immediately, because Mark, uh, Mark in, in his original Greek, never used, he doesn't use the past tense. It's a very strange book. Mark always speaks in the present tense. So Jesus goes, he says, he does, he doesn't, there's nothing in the past tense. The narrative is all written in, in the present tense. So he goes, it doesn't get translated that, that way. But in the original Greek, I, I, I've only once seen a translation into English that doesn't change it into the past tense. But I, I, I saw one of my pro seminary professors made his own translation and translated it into, first, into, uh, uh, into present tense English. He goes into the, um, the home of Simon and Andrew and James and John. Simon's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. He goes over to her. He grasps her hand. He raises her up. In the translation that I have, it says he helps her up. No, he doesn't. He raises her because raise is a really important Christian verb on Easter. Jesus doesn't help, or, or God, does, the Spirit doesn't help Jesus out of the grave. He's raised out of the grave. So uh, um, Simon Peter's mother-in-law is raised, and it says the fever left her, and she immediately began to serve them. I wanted to point out uh, in a, a favorite book of mine on Mark, um, it's called Beyond Fear and Silence. It's by Joan Mitchell. She's a feminist uh, uh, New Testament scholar, and she has really interesting things to say about the, the verb serve in here because it's the word for deacon, diakonos. And it appears several other times in Mark's gospel, and every time it does, it's an example of that person who is the, the uh, fertile soil. If you've been around here the last month and, and heard me preach, I've been preaching about the sower and the seed parable. The, the, do, can we do that together? Do you remember the four way, places the seed landed? I know you know it, Leo. Rocky ground. Right, if it lands on, uh, can we do them in order? Do you remember the first one? But thank you for playing. Just hold that thought, because you're right. What's the first one? The footpath. It lands on the footpath, and the birds eat it up, and nothing happens. Then, rocky, rocky ground, what happens on the rocky ground? It, it starts great. It poops out. 
Yeah, it, 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 it looks great at the very beginning. It, it, it spurts and there's all this energy, but because it's rocky, the, soil, the, the roots can't do much. And then the sun scorches it. And then the third one, it lands among thorns and so it grows just fine until the thorns overtake it. <clears throat> and then Jesus allegorizes the thorns as worries and cares of this world, particularly about money and property. And then the last one, the good soil. Okay, the, um, Peter's mother-in-law ends up being the good soil because she's perfectly receptive to the thing that Jesus offers her, which is release from this fever. Uh, she gets up and serves him, and uh, Joan Mitchell says, she didn't just get up to make sandwiches. She gets up to follow him, and she follows him the same way the other followers follow him. And, she, and one of the things that Jesus does is disrupt the social order and the gender roles that in the, in the early church that tries to live as Jesus did, they have to start looking at each other as equals even though their parents and their grandparents and their great-great-parents did things differently. It's still a challenge for us today because we're a very tradition-bound organization, the church. Not just the Roman Catholic Church, but the churches at all, or any world religion. We're very, we, we really love our traditions. We're about to head into Christmas, and don't we love all of our Christmas traditions? Don't start messing with my traditions. Well. Jesus is coming to disrupt things. Will you allow disruption? Anyway, the, 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 in, in early in Mark, uh, you can just think that Peter's mother-in-law gets up to make sandwiches, and making sandwiches is a good thing. And we're, in and, and church communities, we're all, I'm about to go to Vegas with a whole bunch of people to create 400 food boxes. We're always, that's always an important thing, and, and to, to put ourselves at the service at the very basic level of seeing that people have what they need to eat. Important work. But in here, it, it's not Peter's mother-in-law just doesn't get up to do the sandwiches. She's, she, while the other guys do something more important, she's their equal. That, that can begin to be a little upsetting. Um, they come to him and they say, hey, Jesus, everybody's looking for you. They're annoyed at him because he's keeping somebody waiting. Everybody's looking for you. And we, we're kind of getting it that we're supposed to help people toward you. We're kind of corralling your audience. Everybody's looking for you. What does Jesus say to them? Great, then let's get out of town. If everybody's looking for me, then I've already accomplished everything I can do here. Let's go to the next place. He's not really trying to create a fan club. He's just trying to get people to open their ears, open their hearts, and if everybody's looking for me, well, then there's nothing else to do here. Let's go on to the next place. Right? That's the kind of impact I think you and I can have on the world when the spirit of the, of the living God is moving through us. We don't necessarily have to stand around and provide every answer, but we awaken a hunger in people or something about the way that you live or the way that you are in your office or the way that you are in your extended family just makes people go, ooh. I, I, I kind of want more. And then you can be like Jesus to say, oh, my job's done, I'm out of town. <laughs> I, I've at least awakened a hunger. In chapter two, there's this guy that's sick and there's so many people that are trying to get to Jesus by this time that what do they have to do? They have to rupture the roof. They have to break open the roof. That's the last thing you want to do to a roof. When you put a roof down, you want it to stay in one spot and you don't want it to have a hole in it. But so there's this iconic scene at the beginning of chapter two where we're gonna have to break the roof off this place, blow the roof out of here so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority, he says to the guy on the, on the mat, arise, Easter verb again. Arise, not just get up, arise. Well, the guy does and they're awestruck and then somebody speaks to the crowd and says, we've never seen anything like this. So they see this happen right in front of them and somebody at least says, well, we've never seen anything like this. But what's gonna happen after that? Not much, because they're thorny ground. You know? They can at least note that something important seemed to have happened, but we're not gonna see the town converted. They're either gonna, either the birds ate the seed or it got, joked or something, and nothing's going to happen. They're just going to be amazed. And the, and the word amaze in Mark is not a good thing. You would think it would be. But amazement is like a bottle rocket. 
it, it's flashy for about half a second, and after that it's just dark. Well, they're awestruck. We've never seen anything like this. So they, um, the, the, and, 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 and the idea in a, in a religious setting like a Jewish synagogue, when somebody says, we've never seen anything like this, or in a Roman Catholic setting, and somebody says, well, we've never seen anything like that at Mass. Well, for a minute that might sound good, but oh my. The liturgical law probably prohibited that. You know, or there was probably somebody that's going to be upset because we don't want new things happening around here. We want what we had last week. That's what Jesus found, that his religion was, uh, it's codified and stratified and we knew who belonged and who didn't belong and then he comes along and starts and they've just broke the roof open on this poor guy's house and Jesus is just blasphemed so there's this this big mix of, of uh, tension going on uh, after that he Jesus goes out and he, he finds Levi who's a tax collector he collects taxes from you and gives them to your Roman oppressors so that that they can pay for the soldiers that deprive you of your freedom. That's what your tax money is going for. It's not buying you uh, fire protection and police and, and newly paved roads. What, it, what your taxes are gaining for you is they're paying the salaries of the people that are oppressing you. And Levi is from the, the Levitical clan, which means he belonged to the priestly tribe. There were 12 tribes and one of them, only one of them priests could come from. So he he's represents this priestly line that's tied up with the Roman oppressors. And Jesus just walks right up to him and says, you're just the kind I'm looking for. Why in the world would Jesus go and look for somebody like that and make him the first person that, well not, not the first, but why would he include him in this very small circle of people that he's inviting to be the leaders? God only knows. He doesn't say. He just says, I, I like the way you look. Would you come with me? And Levi does. So the, when, we, when we see the 12 assembled, uh, there's all kinds of folk uh, in them, a zealot. Uh, they were pretty much the terrorists of their age. This, this collaborationist guy that collects the taxes and hands them to Rome. These fishermen. Two guys that are so emotional that they, Jesus nicknames them the thuns of, sons of thunder. Apparently they're, they're, they're just so uh, uh, apt to go off that he nicknames them Boanerges, the sons of thunder. The, he, um, he ends up going, by the end of the chapter, uh, going home into a house full of sinners. And that's where I wanted to ask you, especially have you thinking when you go into your cohort groups, were you, did you ever go to a dinner that disrupted? Did you ever choose to have a meal with somebody that made somebody else angry? Did your, did your simple act of table fellowship, or, or in my family, going to a wedding? going to my brother's wedding when my dad refused to. That was a bad day. <laughs> I remember how we all had to decide. My dad had drawn that line in the sand. I'm not going to that wedding. And all the rest of us, including mom, had to decide, well, okay, what am I going to do? I'm wondering if you, if you ever had a, an occasion in your life where doing a loving thing uh, and maybe, maybe involving table fellowship caused disruption. Jesus ends up saying, why am I doing this? Well, I, I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. This, it's the sick one that needs a doctor. They gripe at him. We're still in chapter 2. We fast. Why don't you? And he says, well, the groom is with them. He, taught, he uses uh, bridegroom uh, language. Weddings, brides and grooms, they're all about unitive love. And that's why we love going to weddings, because they're happy. The, in, in, a, in a matrimonial scene, love is doing what we really want it to do. It's bringing people together. It's, it's overcoming difference. It's, it's uh, uh, all the world loves a lover. Jesus is saying, well, but the groom is with them. I'm the bridegroom. The two become one. And they, get, they weave themselves together, not apart. But then at chapter 2, 21, uh, he goes... Um, well, they can't fast when the groom is with them. The day will come, though, when, they will, when the groom will be taken away, and that day they'll fast. Then he, goes on, he just goes on to this odd thing. He says, no one sews a patch of unshrunken cloth on an old cloak. Think of it. 
You have an old cloak that's been through the laundry lots of times, and then you take a brand new piece of cloth, cut a little bit of it to make a patch, cloth that's never been laundered. Well, it's going to shrink. So if you cut it to the right size to make the patch and then wash it, it's going to shrink. It's not the right size anymore, and it's going to pull away and make the tear even worse. That's what Jesus says. If you do, the very thing that you've used to cover the hole would pull away, the new from the old, and the tear would only get worse. Similarly, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If you do, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wines and the skins will perish. No, you have to pour new wine into new skins. So that's going to be a theme. He's looking for who around here is receptive to something new. Because I, the wine that I'm going to pour into you, it's new, and I need you to be new. Okay? Um, this is so stupid. His, his disciples just happen to be kind of walking through a field, just like you, you and I might have done as kids, and there's some kind of little bit of grain. I didn't grow up where there was wheat, but there were some weeds that kind of looked like wheat, and we used to pretend it was wheat. It had, you know, the little shock on the top of it that looked like wheat. You'd pull it off. We had a lot of clover in our yard. You know, just pull some clover, and you might even chew on it or, you know, twi you know make something out of it, tie it together, whatnot. It's just idleness. It, nothing, nothing to it. You, they just happened to pluck the top off of a little bit of wheat, uh, and, and, oh, my God, the religion police are there to catch them. It happens to be the Sabbath, and that is work, and work is not allowed on the Sabbath because you're harvesting. Well, can you tell the difference between harvesting wheat and pulling, <laughs> pulling a little bit of, pulling one shock off just because your hands were idle? That's pretty much what this is about. They do that, and it becomes this great big deal. Plucking grain becomes breaking the Sabbath law. Jesus goes back into 1 Samuel and into Leviticus and reminds these people that know their Bible so well about a time when Jesus, when not Jesus, when David was about to take his soldiers into battle and there wasn't any food. And so he walked into the tabernacle and ate the bread. Can you imagine? It's, it's there to feed the people. And David just walks right into the tabernacle and, and, and eats the bread and hands it to his soldiers. And, it, and, and in the context, it was thought of as a really courageous, brilliant thing for David to do, and David was a hero. Jesus says, don't you remember? He, he even fed it to his soldiers. Shut up. You know, get off their case. He, 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 what they're doing doesn't deserve your, um, your, the trouble that you're making. So he's, he's saying that you could even walk into the Holy of Holies, walk right into the tabernacle and eat the bread. Well, can you see how that kind of thinking disrupts, disturbs, annoys, angers? What's Jesus rupturing? I think he's, uh, uh, as we go on into chapter 3, there's a guy with a withered hand. He, this guy has a withered hand. Everybody can see it. There's nothing secret about it. And Jesus says to the guy, come and stand up here in the front because I want everybody to have a good view. It's a Sabbath again, and Jesus is going to heal on the Sabbath. He wants everybody to see that this guy has, has got a withered hand. Do you know that before Vatican II, a candidate for the priesthood would have been disqualified if he had any physical disfigurement? You had to take a physical. And if you had like a, a lazy eye, or if you had, you know, you're missing a finger, or you had any, any kind of physical infirmity, it, maybe you had polio when you were younger. They wouldn't ordain you because it was, the idea was that you had to be unblemished. Okay? Well, fortunately, that went away after Vatican II. But I remember when I was filling out the forms and stuff, there was a bunch of stuff that was sort of residual to that period. I, for one thing, I had to prove that my parents were married to one another when I was born, <laughs> that I was legitimate. I even had to go to the church and get the records. Right? So we've come a long way from that, and that's just in my lifetime. But he, this guy has got a withered hand, and it's proof that God's displeased with him. You remember the story of the, the, of the blind, the, the man born blind in John's Gospel, and the disciples talking to one another about was this his sin or his parents' sin? Well, this guy's got a withered hand. He's got to be a sinner. So Jesus pulls him up to the front and says, look right here. Everybody, eyes up front. Look up here. 
he touches the man and heals him. He doesn't just, it's, so it's not just a healing story, it's a confrontational healing story. It's disruptive love. I'm changing the patterns of how you people behave. And from now on, you can't treat people that have some physical deformity, infirmity, deformity like there's something wrong with them, uh, their soul. Stop it. So on the one hand, people are sort of excited about, oh, wow, look at that. He just healed that guy. But what it's going to ask of everybody in the crowd, everybody in the synagogue is, oh my god, I'm going to have to start thinking differently. The way that I was trained, the way that I always picked on that kid in my class, I'm going to have to change the way I look at the world. I'm not so sure I want to do that. I'd rather keep thinking that deformed people must have done something to earn it. I'd rather keep thinking that that beggars probably screwed up their life in such a way that they're having to beg. I, I like the kind of feeling of superiority that it gives me to feel like there's an ordered universe and that God rewards the, uh, the good and punishes the evil. I'm not sure I want what Jesus is selling. So before long, they're going to be throwing him out of the synagogue. Uh, they, the, uh, the Pharisees and Herodians start thinking about how they can destroy him. Unclean spirits fall upon him, and they say, we know who you are. You're the, you're, you are the Son of God. Don't you think calling Jesus the Son of God so- sounds flattering? So you think that's what the demons are doing? Oh, Jesus, we're so happy. We demons, we just, we just love you. No, that's not what demons say. They're, these demons are saying, you're the Son of God. You know why? Because Son of God in that context was a title used only for Caesar. Caesar was a son of God, you know, in that Roman pantheon of gods. So the demons are shouting out in a public place, we know who you are, you're the son of God. What kind of trouble is that going to cause? Jesus is going to be compared with Caesar now. He's going to be Caesar's equal. That's what the demons are up to. They're, they're so in discord. Um, Jesus' family at, ch- at chapter 3, t- uh, 21, they come, um, when his family heard that they had heard about this, they came to take charge of him saying, he is out of his mind. Jesus' family comes to get him saying, he's out of his mind. Scribes from Jerusalem come and they say, he's possessed by Beelzebub. I preached on this not too long ago in a daily mass. I don't know if any of you were there. But they, but they, they call Jesus Beelzebub. You know what that means? Lord of the flies. Right? The place that the, that the flies are the Lord of is the place where in a town in Palestine, when, when, when we got up in the morning, we didn't have a toilet to flush. There was a pot that we had used for that purpose, the whole family. And somebody's job was to take that pot to the downwind side of town where everybody agreed that that's where that goes and dump it. So every town had a spot where all the crap landed, the downwind place. Well, it buzzed with flies, and it would look like a little mountain. And what they're calling Jesus is the Lord of a pile of shit. Thank you very much. <laughs> Beelzebub. He, oh, I know how he can cast out demons because he's the principal demon. In fact, he's Beelzebub. He's the Lord of a pile of shit. That's what he is. Jesus stays there and reasons with them, which I, I just find amazing. If somebody called you that, do you think you could stay in a conversation? What Jesus says is, interesting you should bring that up. (laughs) Because let's follow the logic of that. If in fact I'm using a demon to cast out a demon, well, that's good news because it means there's civil war in hell. And a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. So if you're right, hell is about to fall apart. That's great. That's what Jesus does with that moment. Sometimes I go to him, once in a while people get on my case and insult me. Nobody's called me Beelzebul, but I've come, called a few things. And I, I just try to have that peace that Jesus has that says, 
I will stay here and I will do what I've got to do. I'm going to, I'll take what you give me and I'll work with that. Um, I'm going to skip over a little bit. Chapter 4 is the, is the parallel to the sea that we've covered pretty well. At the beginning of chapter 5, the Gerasene demoniac, he smashes, he screams, he gashes, he shrieks, he's tortures. He says, there are legions of us. Send us into those swine. There are legions of us. That's a Roman word. There are legions of us. Send us into those swine. Well, nobody, the demons had never seen pigs commit suicide before. But they, the demons are cast into these swine, and the whole herd runs and hurls itself off a cliff. And the guy that's, that's been demon-possessed is now fully restored and is just doing great. But the people in that area just say, get out of here. We don't know who you are, where you're from. We don't want you around. That's one of the impacts that disruptive love has in the world. We'd, we'd rather, we'd prefer the demon we know than the demon we don't know. And we don't know exactly what you're all about. We'd really like things the way they were, even though that poor guy was chained to a... Uh, had uh, a, uh, a gravestone, and now he's healthy. Uh, get out of here. Jesus says to him, go home to your family and make it clear to them how much the Lord in his mercy has done for you. Finally, at chapter 5, verse 21, there's a scene of a synagogue leader. We've, we've been in synagogue several times already, and it really hasn't gone well. Uh, Jesus ends up upsetting people in his synagogue. But the, the synagogue leader, his daughter, is near death. And at 521, says, um, Now when Jesus had crossed back to the other side, a crowd gathered. Uh, one of the officials of the synagogue named Jairus, he came near. My daughter is critically ill. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she'll get well and live. So they went off together, and a crowd came pushing Jesus. So they're on their way to heal the guy when there's this sandwich technique. They're on their way to, to back to, the, to Jairus' house, and then this woman comes up, and we're told that she uh, has from the area, she's been afflicted with a hemorrhage for a dozen years. And this is a kind of a, this is a woman problem thing. Uh, she's an older woman, so it's not just menstruation, it's some kind of blood problem so she's not, it's not about pregnancy, it's not about menstruation. She's an older woman with some kind of woman problem that's making her bleed. And it's been going on for years. She's been to doctors and she's went through her savings. So her, her blood is pouring out and it's not about life giving, it's about death. You know, the life is pouring out of her. And the Jews had a, a horror and a sense of grossness about anything involving women's blood. Uh, it runs all through the Old Testament into the New. Uh, she had received, she, uh, the doctors had taken all her money. She hears about Jesus. She comes up behind him in the crowd and says, if I can just touch his clothing, I'll get well. So she touches the hem of his garment. Um, and, the, and it says, the, immediately the flow of blood dried up and the feeling that she was cured of her affliction ran through her whole body. Jesus wheels around and says, who touched my clothing? Fearful and beginning to tremble, the woman comes forward and says, it, it was me. And Jesus just says, you're cured. Go in peace and be free of this illness. Then we go back to the other scene. They're getting to the house of Jairus. The little girl is well, where, where they get there, and people come out and say, your daughter's dead. Why bother the teacher any further? Jesus disregards them and says, fear is useless. What's needed is trust. And he wouldn't let anybody go with him except Peter, James, and John. They go into the house of the synagogue leader. Jesus tells all the people that are grieving to get out of here. He goes up to the, the, to, the, to the people and says, why are you making all this noise with your wailing? This child isn't dead. She's just asleep. He threw them out. Jesus took the child's father and mother and his own companions, and he enters the room where the child was, and holding her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, little girl, arise. The little girl was 12, so she's really on the cusp of coming into puberty. And there's going to, the, the, the blood that will rise up in her body that's rising could give new life. So there's this kind of uh, contradistinction of, of an old woman sick and a young woman dead who's coming back to life. Right? The little girl of 12 stands up and immediately begins to walk around. The, the family was astonished. Their astonishment knew no bounds. He enjoined them strictly not to let anybody know about it. And then he said, give her something to eat. We're going to stop now. Uh, because I've gone about five minutes over my time. 
in the little handout that I've made, uh, I put some questions in here, and there's three little question marks that denote where there's a question. So those, those of you that are leading the conversation in your groups, uh, just go over it. Um, but all the theme running throughout is the theme of the talk, the law and disorder, the disruptive love of Jesus. How has love operated in your life in a way that shook things up, that disrupted <coughs> things? That's our theme. Okay? Are there any questions? Uh, Isaiah, you need to give any announcement stuff or... No? All right. Remember that next week we don't meet because we're on uh, Thanksgiving break. So our next session will be two weeks from now. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.